All right. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13 today, and some other places as well, but I will let you know when we get there uh, where you need to go, and you'll have plenty of time to find it. The sermon series is called Our God, and, and it's the, the whole intention is to discover what the Ten Commandments teach us about the person of God, not just our obedient response to God, but why are these ten words from God so important to him that these are the first things he communicates to Israel after they have been emancipated from slavery. And so here we look at Exodus 20, verse 13, and I can't help but wonder... What went through Moses' head when he heard this one? Forty years before this, before this moment, Moses had just dusted himself from what he had done, adrenaline pumping, his rage temporarily satisfied. Forty years from this, prior to this moment, when Moses realized that he wasn't the hero in this story, and when he feared the swift and sure accountability for taking an Egyptian life in anger, he ran. A fugitive in the wilderness, Moses spent 40 years tending sheep, building a family, and forgetting or trying to forget his crime of passion. Then, in the same wilderness, Moses heard the unmistakable crackle of fire. Upon further investigation, God spoke from the fire and commissioned Moses to go back to the country he had fled and demand the release of the Hebrew people, his people. After failed negotiations with Yahweh, Moses did return. And he marveled at what God had accomplished. The people, his people, were now free and on a God-ordained path to the land of promise. Yahweh, along the way, wanted to establish his covenant with his people. So here at the base of Mount Sinai, they gathered in fear as God again spoke out of the fire. No other gods except me. No man-made or God-made objects of worship, only me. Do not take up my name and live it as if it's empty. Keep the Sabbath holy. Live in a way that brings honor to your mother and your father. No murder. As these words thundered from the mountain, I can't help but wonder what washed over Moses. Knowing that here he stood in the presence of the Almighty, condemned already. Did he justify his actions from 40 years before? Did he fear for his life? Did he feel that all eyes were on him as if they knew of his trespass? Was Moses simply humbled again in God's presence as his adrenaline and mind slowed to realize that he was still standing? Not just in the fear of God, but in his mercy? We will never know what Moses experienced in that moment. The Bible doesn't tell us. What we can know is that on its face, this sixth commandment is obvious and it makes sense in the most obvious way. Don't take someone's life. Don't murder. No murder. It makes sense. However, as we unpack the motivation and the heart of God in direct contrast to the motivation and heart of murder, we will see just how vital this commandment is. 
We've already said it numerous times. No mataras. Mataras. There we go. No mataras. No murder. That's exactly how the Hebrew has it. Two words. No murder. I hate to break it to you, but the King James got it wrong because it says, thou shalt not kill. And you know, kill is actually very broad, isn't it? Murder's a lot more specific. Murder's a whole lot more specific. In fact, murder is a willful act. Murder is a willful act. And motivation is a key determiner or determinant of deeming something to be murder. This is specifically a word designated for the willful taking of human life, not just killing an animal, not justice killing as in a, a justified war or self-defense or law enforcement. This is, here we're going to get to the motivation right out of the gate. This is me or you determining that someone's life holds less value than mine. That is where murder starts. Someone else's life holds less value than mine, therefore I can mistreat, hold a grudge, right? And we can all agree that, that the, this, this murder is really the, the, the finality of something that happens way before you get to murder. You have convinced yourself of your overinflated value and convinced yourself of someone else's underinflated value long before you got to the point of taking their life. So when God says don't murder, he's talking about the end of the story. The end of this progression of thought. And we can all agree that the end of that story, to, uh, to intentionally take someone's life, is a heinous crime against humanity. But it's also a crime against God. Why? We'll get there. We'll get there. But what we need is we need to remember our baseline. Our baseline are the two greatest commandments. Right? The Shema. You are to love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the second is like it. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. The Ten Commandments encompass the practical reality of what that looks like. The first four commandments. This is what it looks like to love God with everything. To love God as if he is everything because he is everything. And this is what it looks like for someone who loves God to love your neighbor as yourself. And so here we see, do not willfully take someone's life. So these commandments are teaching us about the character of God and also the specific spelled out for Israel and all future children of God as to how to live out those two great commandments. So does God's word shed light on how murder is a crime against both humanity and God? Yes, it does. I'm glad you asked. If you will, turn to Genesis chapter 9. And we're going to look at verses 6 and 7. Genesis 9, 6, and 7. This is at the end, the tail end of a very, very familiar story where God chose a man... The Bible's not staying open. Named Noah to build an ark to save creation from judgment. Right? And after they survive this ordeal, they come out 
and Moses or and God is giving them commands and he's actually going to make a covenant with Noah and so this comes from a covenant that is ages before the covenant God is now making with Israel this covenant is made with all of humanity because that's all that Noah is with his three sons and their wives they are all of humanity so God makes this covenant with everyone who is and who will ever be and that's why this becomes very important he says in verse 6 whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed for God made man in his own image and you be fruitful and multiply increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it so we have a couple of things going on here, don't we? The first one, verse 6, whoever sheds the blood of men, this is murder language. By man shall his blood be shed, that's justice language. You commit murder, there shall be justice, life for a life, right? That's what God is saying here to all of humanity. And then he gives a reason why. Why is this such a heinous crime? Because man is created in whose image? God's. So to say, to, to develop a thought process that allows you to justify taking someone's life is for you to say, God made a mistake. You do not deserve to live. Do you see why God might be a little offended by that? Taking life that God purposed to exist for his glory, whether that person gives God glory or not, isn't the issue. But to take the life of of a, a take life that God purposed to exist for his glory is a blatant and direct rebellion against God's command in this text. Because you notice how he, he doesn't actually say don't murder. He just says, if you do this, this is the consequence. That's what he says, right? What, what's the command? Well, the command is in verse 7. What does that say? And you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply it. What does this mean? This means, as image bearers of God, we are to give life, not take it. We are to give life and not take it. Why? Because that's what God does. He gives life. He sustains life. And he also takes it, but he's completely good and justified. We are not. So to, to, for me, who is created in the same image of God as anyone else, to determine, nah, I don't like the way that you bear their image is to put myself in the place of God, right? And to try and snuff out a life that God made. And I want to reiterate, this command precedes the Ten Commandments, which gives us in insight into who God is. This comes very, very early in our history. In fact, one of the first sins committed by man, which we will find when we look at 1 John again, what John is referencing is the murder of Cain, or murder of Abel by Cain. The very first children of Adam and Eve are taking one another's lives, right? But our God doesn't only give life, he is life. Nothing exists 
apart from God's will for it to exist. Nothing is sustained apart from God's will to sustain it. Let that sink in. Nothing exists except for God's will to make it exist. Nothing stays alive without God's will keeping it alive. So we've gone all the way back in history. Now let's go forward. What does Jesus say about murder? Jesus, he doesn't pull any punches when he goes to the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22. And this is one of those texts that is simple to understand, but also really complex. Why is it complex? Because in my human mind, I'm trying to figure out, well, how can I, how can I be angry and right? Anyone else in here trying to be angry and right? Oh, just me. Well, all right. This message is for me. You guys can just hang out. I'm going to keep preaching. In verse 21 of chapter 5, Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. Right? And also, whoever murders will be liable to judgment. We We just covered that, didn't we? Right? We just covered that. So Jesus is now referencing exactly what we've just talked about. And then he says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Those two words, judgment, are joining the ideas together, right? If you murder, you're liable to judgment. And Jesus is adding to that, using judgment as a, as a motif to connect the two ideas together. Anger, same judgment. So you're sitting there and you're thinking, did he just say anger and murder get the same judgment? Now, if you're a Jewish person, what did we just say that was the judgment for murder? Your own life. There is no sacrifice apart from your own life to cover for this sin. That is the parallel Jesus is making in this statement. Anger, you're liable to the same judgment. Pump the brakes, Jesus. I'm angry you're saying this. Right? Are you serious right now? Who hasn't been angry? Right? And this comes right after he made this mind-blowing, earth-shattering statement of you have to be more righteous than the Pharisees. He just said that before he says this. So they're already thinking, how can I be more righteous than the guys who wrote laws to protect us from breaking the laws? You have to be more righteous from them. And then he says, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And what Jesus has set the stage for is basically what Paul will say in Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin is death. This is Jesus' version of that. You have to be more righteous than the Pharisees. Guess what? I'm going to do that for you. And to prove my point, you've heard it said not to commit murder. You're familiar with that. You're familiar with the penalty for murder, that you're liable to judgment. And what I'm telling you in God's economy... Anger is equal to murder in the sense that you have devalued through your anger someone who is made in God's image. And so you're liable to the same judgment because the heart that leads to murder is the same heart that harbors anger against someone else. And he's proving to them 
you're not righteous. You're not as righteous as you think you are. You need me. My goodness. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. I don't think this is his opening joke. These are hard words to hear. Is Jesus saying that my internal thoughts, my internal attitude towards someone else makes me guilty just like as if I had murdered? Yes. That's what he's saying. Now, if you're like me, you feel hopeless when you hear that. You feel hopeless. But now let's go to John, 1 John, sorry, 1 John 3, 11. And we'll read all the way through 16. There are two slides for this verse, so hopefully you can keep up. 1 John 3, starting in verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. Again, referencing what we've already referenced. That we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. This is judgment language. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. This is pretty serious. Serious. And what he's saying is he's saying the world hates. The world hates. But Christians, followers of Jesus, people of the way, they love. And Jesus also said this in the book of John. They will know you are my disciples by what you stand against. No by how well you love one another. That's the mark. That's the mark. How well you love one another. Anyone here ever shopped for a church? Doesn't that sound weird? But you visited some churches, you visited some churches. You know what's really interesting? Most people decide whether or not they're going to stay at a church by one thing. Were they glad I was there? I've never had someone come to me on a first Sunday and say, I want to talk to you about your theological statement. I've never had someone choose to stay initially because worship was great or my sermon was great. Every single person tells me a story. When we came here, we felt welcomed. We felt loved. This is people here at this church. Good job. But then they also tell another story about the other churches they visited where that wasn't the case. And so if you don't think Jesus' words and John's words here are powerful, that they will know you are my disciples by how well you love each other, the evidence is in that. When you show up 
to where God's people are, do you know this is where I belong? They love each other. I think that's really important. We don't agree on everything in this room, do we? No. I don't even agree with everything that goes on in my own house. Right? And neither does anyone else in my house. But the Spirit has united us. The Spirit has united us, and that allows us, between language barriers, between culture barriers, between political barriers, to not harbor hate and prejudice in our hearts, to not harbor anger towards one another, but to say, same spirit. They have the same spirit. We can love. Is it hard sometimes? Absolutely. Absolutely. But we have two things here. We have two things talked about. Jesus talks about anger, and John talks about hatred. Those are kind of progressions, aren't they? Going from anger to hatred. But what I think is happening here is unresolved anger, because what, what's happening is, is, is Jesus actually says, if, if, you're at, if you ha- are bringing something to the altar and you have an issue with someone else, leave what you have at the altar and go to your accuser and make amends. Don't sit there and harbor anger against them. Why? Because you are liable to judgment. You're coming here and you're saying, I'm worshiping God, here's my sacrifice. Yet, there is no sacrifice that covers the grotesque sin of murder. So you need to go make it right. This, 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 am I building the bridge okay? You have to go make it right. Because what is this? This is just show. There's no sacrifice. There's no offering to make. Because it is in a murderous heart, it is your life that is required. So go make it right. God's not fooled. You know what's really interesting? I wonder how unresolved anger morphs into this murderous kind of attitude. And I thought of a couple things. We actually have language for it in English. Oh, they're dead to me. Anyone have a a kid that was rebellious? And you just wanted to be like, no, just go away. <laughs> Stop. Hopefully you didn't stay that way. But what I'm saying is it's very real. It's very natural, not Christ natural, but it's very natural as a human to want to just ignore or, or, or treat someone as if they are dead to us simply because they aren't agreeing with us. And so we oftentimes can wish someone dead. Right? You never tell someone to go to heaven. I'm so glad you got that joke. I won't say the other one. But that's basically wishing someone dead. And the worst kind of death. Right? You treat others as if they are dead. Hatred then goes beyond anger, which is what John talks about, and that it believes that someone's life is worthless. I can hate you because you're nothing. You're wrong. You're an idiot. Whatever it is. And we justify it. So when we allow anger and hatred to determine the value of someone's life, 
rather than the person of God who is life, the, the God who gave life, the God who is sustaining life, mine and theirs. We are denying, we are robbing, we are stealing from God his rightful glory because of our anger and our hatred. And yes, that is what murder does. Why? Because God created in every human his image. And he's given every human an opportunity to know him and to enjoy him forever. And yeah, we could talk about all kinds of issues around this. The taking of children in utero. Abortion. But there's another anger that happens in us that we feel is justified, and that is anger towards maybe a mother who had an abortion. Hatred for women who believe it's the right thing to do. Right? Both are wrong. Both are murderous. So as Christians, we actually have to think about how do we think through this issue so that we are validating the image that God created in everyone's life and how do we love without giving permission? Right? Because we very easily can take an issue and turn it into a matter of anger and hatred that then says, you aren't worth anything. Therefore, I can think this about you. Does that sound gross to anyone else? That just sounds awful. And it should. Because murder, whether anger or hatred or the physical taking of someone's life, is gross. It is a violation of the character of God who is life. We're often deceived into thinking that our anger or hatred is justified and maybe even godly. The truth is, is that our anger and our hatred seeks to harm others in a way that says, I'm more valuable and you're less valuable. When we both bear the same image of God. This is why reconciliation is of utmost importance in the ongoing discipleship of every believer. That's what Jesus was talking about. Be reconciled to one another. This is in that same sermon Jesus says to love your enemy, to pray for those who persecute you. This is why. This is why, because they bear the image of God. And if they remain an enemy of God, they have no hope. And how are they going to remain an enemy of God if those who know Jesus and represent him are doing this to them? Right? This is a tough message. It's a serious command. You don't feel nearly as uncomfortable as Israel did on that day at the base of Mount Sinai. So praise God for that. There's no thunder or lightning or flaming, booming voice of God here. But the message ought to be just as sobering. God values life because God made life, because God is life. This is why we are not to sin in our anger. This is why we are to share with those in need, as John will go on in 1 John chapter 3 to spell out. Christians do not wish death upon others in thought or deed. Christians seek to give life to all because God is life. 
This is very different than justice, okay? This is about our responsibility to bring the good news of Jesus to all. Preemptive love. No matter what you've done, Jesus will forgive you. That's our initial attitude. And he will help you to reconcile the wrongs that you have done. Whether it be murder or otherwise. And that's true of all of us. This is actually good news. Because God wants life. Jesus even said it. It is my desire that none should perish. And this is after a whole group of people left him. Because he said some hard things. It is my desire that none should perish. But I'm going to tend to the ones that God has brought. Is it our desire that none should perish? But to be faithful with the people that God has brought into our lives. To not harbor anger. To not develop hatred. And if we are, to deal with it with the Lord and his help. Anger and hatred are destructive. And I pray that we will choose life and godly love that is welcoming even if it's not permission given. I can't emphasize that enough. But Jesus is the one that transforms, not our bad attitudes. Okay? I think I did it two weeks in a row without yelling. Hmm? I don't angry yell, I just excited yell. Anyway, that has nothing to do with anything. Would you pray with me? Lord, I'm going to admit that um, there have been times in the preparation of this series that my anger has run away. And I've actually, knowing I was going to preach about this, had to go and do what I could to make things right. And I'm reminded every single time when relationships that were broken are repaired of just how wonderful life is. Because you have brought new life into this relationship that was broken. Because of my actions. Lord, I don't want to be an angry person. I don't want to hate. I want your life and your love on your terms to be my calling and my lifestyle. I want that for those of us in this room. I'm certain you do too. And all we can say is help. We need help. And we thank you that you have given it to us in your Holy Spirit. Be honored with the rest of our day, the rest of our week. And draw us ever more close to you and your life. And others with us. And in your name. Amen.